Hello and welcome to our presentation. We are going to talk about how to live well with arthritis of the hand. My name is Brianne Bell and I am an occupational therapist currently pursuing 4,000 hours to specialize in hand therapy, as well as Paige Ryback, who is over to my right. And then we have Christine Clements and I'll let her tell you a little bit about herself. Well, I'm a certified hand therapist. I uh, have uh, multiple years of experience treating the hand and upper extremity, and arthritis happens to be one of my favorite diagnoses to work with. So we're going to go over some basic information for everyone, and hopefully you'll be able to learn a little bit about um, things that will make you feel better along the way. So the first thing, just briefly, the objectives we want to cover today is just for everyone to be able to gain a basic understanding of arthritis. Um, we're going to talk more about the fact that there's numerous forms of arthritis, but we're going to narrow our presentation today to rheumatoid and osteoarthritis. We all also just want to give you some basic facts about arthritis. We want to help you learn some conservative management techniques, and then um, a little bit about the role of occupational therapy with arthritis. So the first slide here, let's just go over basics. Everyone knows what a hand is, but what's so interesting about the hand is it's multifaceted. There's multiple joints in the hand. That makes it an amazing precision instrument and a functional um, appendage, obviously, but it also leaves it, unfortunately, um, susceptible to the ill effects of arthritis. So what you see here is basically the distal forearm, the end of the arm, where it meets the wrist, then you have the wrist proper. The wrist is a series of small little bones. They stabilize the wrist. They're very important to be able to move your hand through an arc of motion and leave it while your fingers do the work. And then we go on to the back of the hand bones called the metacarpals. Then we have the phalanxes and there's three of them in each finger and two in the thumb. So what you need to know is a healthy joint. It's where one end meets the other one. It's actually covered in a material called cartilage. That cartilage allows you to do thousands and thousands of joint repetitions smoothly. That joint is also bathed in a very viscous fluid um, called synovium, and that gives this beautiful instrument. You're able to, you're able to glide one bone against the, the next. But that cartilage is so important because it acts as a padding at the ends of the bone, reduces friction. You don't even know you have it until you don't. Then it becomes a problem. Okay. So statistically, you know, you look at the number 25.7 million adults have arthritis. When the population of the U.S. is somewhere around 330 million people, that's a lot of people with arthritis. So we see a lot of people who are in all stages of arthritis. It can, affect, it can affect children, adults, the elderly. I know most people think of it being an old person's disease, but you're going to find out that it actually affects younger people as well. So we're going to talk about that. Unfortunately, women are more affected than men, um, specifically women over 50. But it affects men, women, all races, all genders. And one more tidbit, there are multiple types of arthritis. There's some examples listed in there, psoriatic, gout, juvenile arthritis, et cetera. We're going to focus this presentation on OA and RA. So the first section is on, on osteoarthritis. You've probably heard of this before. It's considered a wear and tear disease. People use their hands in manual labor or repetitively or repetitively, repetitively against resistance. Those joints at some point are going to give out. Enough is enough. They're designed and geared for a lifetime, but unfortunately, some people subject their hands to much more force and repetition than others. Arthritis is going to affect all joints of the body, your feet, your knees, your hip back, neck, especially your upper extremities. That's what we're going to talk about today. Unfortunately, it's progressive and degenerative. It's not going to get better. And, and with OA, what happens is that cartilage we talked about, that beautiful glass-like surface at the end of the bones, it breaks down. And then when you have bone on bone and no padding, you're going to have symptoms. 
you're going to have weakness, limitations, emotions, complaints of pain, etc. Some of the things that make OA a little worse are risk factors like being overweight, history of joint injuries, your age, and then like we talked about repetitive stress. So with OA, you're typically going to find unilateral symptoms or one side of the body. You might have just your right hand has trouble or just your left. You might have pain just sitting still or when you move, you're going to find that you're less flexible and you're stiff. People talk about morning stiffness. It's difficult to get going in the morning. You're going to appreciate that. Um, you might even find or hear, hear or feel, I should say, clicking or popping or grinding on a joint when you go to move it. You're going to find things like if you had your hand x-rays, x-rayed, there might even be like little cavities in the bones or bone st spurs sticking out. And as your structures move, um, like your muscles or your tendons move across your joints, sometimes those little spurs stick in them and they hurt. So bone spurs, they're evident on x-ray and that's one of the diagnostic criteria they're gonna use. You might also feel these actual hard lumps at the end of your fingers. Those are called um, uh, Bouchard's no nodules and they form with an excess bony growth. So you might feel these deformities of lumps at your, at your uh, joints. You're gonna, you may have tenderness, you may have swelling around the joint, et cetera. One of the things that um, is important to know is we can say, okay, I have osteoarthritis and my back hurts or my knee hurts or whatever the case is. When it comes to the hand, the most, I shouldn't say the most prevalent because that's not necessarily true, but one of the things that happens that's um, very common is that it's called carpal metacarpal joint osteoarthritis, which is right here, your first CMC joint. This is the one that wears out. And the reason it does is if you look at your hand, your fingers bend back and forth. And they do a very nice job of being your little worker bees. However, the thumb is the kingpin. He's a saddle joint, so he rotates. He not only gets the flexion extension, but he rotates. If you've heard about, about people having a total hip, well, this joint is a lot like your hip because it rotates. So it gets worn out faster. But anyhow, we're going to talk a little bit more about CMC joint. Um, just so you know, um, you're going to, if you do have CMC joint arthritis, which is the most commonly worn out joint of the hand, you're going to notice when you go to turn a key in a lock, maybe opening a jar, you're going to notice it hurts down here. You may appreciate some weakness with your grip or pinch strength, less motion, your thumb sometimes actually falls off his bone here and you'll see a strange deformity occurring. And then a lot of times you have swelling down here or in this meaty muscle mass, you'll find that this is more rounded and chubby. So that's OA in a nutshell. We have more to say about that, but we're gonna go on for a minute to rheumatoid arthritis. And what's the difference? There is a difference. Uh, one of the big differences is RA is actually an autoimmune or inflammatory disease. That means the immune system attacks your healthy cells. It causes inflammation. Inflammation, long-term inflammation in the joint causes damage to the tissue. This tissue can be long-lasting or chronic. Again, you end up with weakness, limitations in motion, swelling and deformity. Here's the thing though, you really need to see a rheumatologist. A rheumatologist specializes in the arthritic process. They have a lot of very helpful drugs, medications that can help you reduce pain and help to slow the process of progression of this disease. You don't have the same types of um, medications involved with osteoarthritis that you do rheumatoid but it is important that you see a rheumatologist to have those two separated and then take you down the path that makes the most sense to help, like I said, alleviate some of your symptoms. So a little different than OA is with RA, typically you have more than one joint affected at the same time. You're gonna have stiffness and limitations in mobility with more than one joint. Again, you're gonna have tenderness and swelling but oftentimes the system symptoms are bilaterally. 
where osteoarthritis is typically unilaterally. Not that you couldn't have it on both sides, but one might start first and then six months later, you have trouble with the other side. Again, differing from OA from RA, you may have fever, fatigue. Um, we talked about weakness and maybe even weight loss. You can see in this slide, there's some pretty dramatic changes with that can occur over time. So with an arthritic hand, probably what's most noticeable other than the deviation, the way the fingers move sideways, is the swelling that you're gonna see at those big joints of the hands, the metacarpal joints here. If you're having a flare up, you literally have chubby um, raised pockets of fluid. That's an excess of synovium. It's pretty hallmark for RA but you can have some pretty significant um, deformities. Like I said, the deviation of the fingers, the fingers might move backwards, they might move forward, you go to make a fist and you're limited and can't fire those fingers like you used to before. So there's a lot of treatment options. That's why you have to go to your rheumatologist, have your family doctor uh, set up a consultation for you. That's always the best idea. Just in a nutshell though, there's lots of medications for both, but more for rheumatoid arthritis. There's always a referral for occupational or physical therapy or occupational therapists. Um, people use their hands in their activities of daily living. So we're typically gonna be your first entry into the system. We're experts in the hand and upper extremity. So we have a lot to say about what might be helpful. We can make things like splints. They're, out, they're actually called orthotics as well. Those might make you more comfortable and help to slow down the deforming process sometimes. And then as a last resort, there's surgery. But that referral for a treatment option, conservative care, coming to OT or PT is a great way to start. We can have a conversation and say, this is what we can offer you. We can probably help to point you in a direction a different direction you might need and you might not have known about yet. So conservative care to outpatient occupational therapy is a pretty valuable way to start the process. So a few things that us as occupational therapists can help you with are listed in front of you. And we can start with energy conservation strategies, which we will get into joint preservation techniques. We will specialize or make a special exercise program for you because not everybody will be treated exactly the same. It varies greatly from person to person. So one exercise that might be particular for one will not be a great fit for the other, depending on your progression. We work on pain management. We can use some adaptive equipment that we will show you a little bit later on that will make your day-to-day -day lives easier, not using those hands as tools that we use them for every single day. And again, like Christine said, some orthotic management, also known as splints, more generally. So energy conservation. So the main takeaway of this topic of energy conservation is saving enough energy to do the important things in your life. So a few ways we can help you do that is help you come up with a plan for your day, your week, your month to be able to do everything in the day that you need to get done. One way to do that is you can alternate heavy and light activities. And a great example that we like to give our patients is if you your energy was a gallon of water, like in a milk jug, and throughout your day, you have to pour that milk jug out a little bit to do what you need to do. So in the morning, oh, I got to wash the dishes. A little bit of your water gets poured out. And then you have to go to the garden and do some yard work. More water gets poured out. Well, at the end of the day, you're having significant pain and swelling and weakness, but your water jug's empty to where you're not able to do everything else in your day that's important, like cook dinner, maybe preparing the kids for bed, different things like that. So making sure you're alternating those heavy and light activities allows your jug to refill a little bit so you have more to pour later on in the day. So that's where we come in, maybe doing those strenuous activities in the morning when you have more energy, when your jug is more full, as well as taking breaks and breaking it into smaller components. So if you have a lot of yard work to do, maybe doing one section at a time, taking a break when that pain starts to arise. 
Furthermore, these are a few ways we can help you is you want to make sure your spaces are organized. I know for me in particular, my pots and pans are not near the kitchen stove. So I have to go across the kitchen, grab my pots and pans, carry it over. Well, that distance from carrying that heavy pot over to my stove, you're emptying your milk jug during that time. So keeping your pots and pans right below or in the cupboard next to it decreases the amount of time and distance you have to carry it, putting less stress on your joints. You can also use tools. Every day we use our hands to do a multitude of things. So using tools like electric mixers instead of whisks where you have to use your hands, mixing that cake better, that's nice and thick, you're using a lot of your joints, as well as can openers. The automatic ones are highly recommended because you're not cranking those smaller joints repetitively over and over. Again, allowing yourself rest. And when you do have a flare up, making sure you are taking those rests. Don't push yourself past the point of pain. We'll talk about a little later too with exercises and with your day-to-day -day life. Pain does not equal more gain like they usually do for other types of exercises. Pain is your number one signal that it is time to take a break and rest. Yeah. Indulging in other activities as well that don't cause as much stress or strenuous activity in general, like that require a little energy, reading a book, maybe finding other hobbies that doesn't, like a lot of our men, they like to um, use tools and kind of just take breaks from those sorts of things, not using your hands as those tools. Again, spreading your tasks throughout the day and making sure you have enough energy at the end. Do not attempt to accomplish more than what is realistic. We have this grand standard of doing everything in one day when in reality, when we were in that much pain, we might not be able to get everything done in an hour or in five hours or in that one day. So making sure you are setting a realistic standard for yourself can bring you a long way. And again, you can ask for assistance whenever necessary. If you are having pain, Maybe asking your husband to do the dishes or asking your wife to help carry some stuff inside. Those different adaptations can help a lot. So as related to the joint preservation principles, the title is important to talk about for a second. You're trying to maintain the function you have. You're not going to get um, the cartilage back. Once it's worn, it's gone. So you're now working with equipment that isn't pristine or isn't brand new, and you need to respect that. So some of the things that Bree was touching on earlier, we want to reduce effort and force. It doesn't mean that you have to stop doing things. You don't have to stop gardening. You do have to stop pulling weeds for 45 minutes at a time with a resisted pinch and prehension. You might have to use gardening tools that are wider and easier to hold. The smaller the grip, the tighter the pinch, the harder it is, the harder it is on your joint. So you're going to try to avoid positions of deformity too. You want to use proper work height. You want to exercise in a pain-free motion. You want to maintain your muscle strength and joint range of motion, increase stability. There are even programs community-wide. Some people still have pools that their temperature is a little warmer. It's easier to exercise. Think about this. When you try to go through painful motions and you're moving your body weight against gravity, it's hard. Once you're in a pool, some of those stressors are relieved and it's much, e much easier to go through motion. You also, like Bree talked about earlier, you have to respect pain. You No pain, no gain is not appropriate here. Once you start having pain or when you know it's typically the time for the onset of pain, you need to change your behaviors. One more thing is whenever you can, you should substitute large, larger joints for typically, like for example, if I'm gonna go out to my car and I just bought groceries, I'm gonna try and pick up four bags of groceries in one hand by the plastic handles and walk them into the house because I don't wanna make more than one trip. That's fine for somebody who doesn't have any issues with their joint, but once I reach out away from my body, I've now increased the weight of whatever I'm picking up. I'm using the smallest joints of my hand as opposed to my wrist, my forearm, even my shoulder. So whenever you can, you're going to use the larger joints and you're going to use bilateral joint motion. So I tell people all the time, if you can, instead of getting those plastic bags at the grocery store, 
get the paper bags. And when you carry them, you're gonna hold it one way and underneath with the other hand, carry it from place to place, from the car to the house, whatever the case is. Um, then you have to make more trips. So that's the unfortunate part. Um, it says just a notation here about sliding objects versus picking up and carrying them. Um, use palms up or bilateral palms when you can do different activities. And then keep whatever weight you have closer to the body. So one thing that occupational therapy can do is we will specialize you with an exercise program. So again, like we said before, it is not the same from person to person. So making sure you are getting screened or having a consultation with a occupational therapist is your best course of action when it comes to the exercise programs. A few of the things that these programs will kind of integrate into your treatment plan could be doing a range of motion, which includes reducing your stiffness, and we're trying to increase that mobility to cause less pain for the joints. Moving your joints through the full range of motion is very important. A lot of the stress balls and different things that you may or may not be doing for hand exercises when we see people come in is they grab onto that ball, but it doesn't allow your fist to go into a full functional fist. When we grab items, we're never here. We're always doing that full functional range. So making sure those joints are moving through that full range of movement. We also will include stretching exercises to help maintain or regain that normal range of motion with our arthritis. Sometimes your range is more limited than others. So kind of finding where you specifically lie with range of motion, we will also help with. It should not create pain. We are going to really hit home on this because it is supposed to be a pain-free arc of motion and you don't want to cause any more flare-ups than you are already having. We will also work on building up your strength. We want to build up your tendons and your ligaments and your muscles to support and protect those joints. We also recommend that some strengthening exercises should be completed every other day at a moderate level. If you are doing those repetitive motions over and over, sometimes every day exercise is too much, especially for those arthritic joints. We want to decrease the amount of resistance if it does become too painful. So if squeezing, or for example, it will go to a broader thing with lifting. So if I'm lifting five pounds and that's too much, it's causing too much pain, I might think about reducing that load to one to three pounds so it's not causing pain. You want to try to stay as active as possible to prevent those joints from getting, getting stiff. But again, you really have to respect your tolerance to pain. The other thing we also can talk about is our uh, aerobic exercise. This will help not only your overall fitness level, but maintain that range of motion and strength. It improves your cardiovascular health and it can help control weight and give you more stamina, building up that endurance. And that provides you more energy throughout your day to do the things that you need to do and the things that you love to do. There's a, a comment I'm sure you've heard before. It's use it, use it or lose it. And it's specifically, or more, more specifically with osteoarthritis, if you set the bar low, that's where your joints are going to respond low. That's why when Bree was talking about using a hand exerciser, when you're only coming halfway, why would your hands want to move all the way? So when we use a hand exerciser in our clinic, we use a sponge, has some resistance to it, but they're able to overcome it to come into the palm all the way. But my whole point is use it or lose it. You have to keep mobile or you've just lowered the bar and your muscle strength, your range of motion, your, your joint motion is gonna to respond to that. But I know people have a lot of questions about hand exercise or hand exercises. We're gonna talk about a couple of things. There's something called differential tendon gliding exercises. And that's a series of positions that you take your hands through and it moves almost all um, of the muscles and structures through your hands. So it's a series of five. This is just motion for differential tendon gliding exercises. You can Google it. There's all different pictures on the internet. It starts off with an alligator. I'm actually going to show them in a minute. Oh, okay. sorry. We've got a picture here. Sorry about that. But what you need to know is these, mo these this specific, specific set of motion 
takes you through all the motion of the hand that makes the most sense. And it's been said that differential tenaglutine exercises are as important to the hand as aerobic exercises to the heart. So it allows for motion, like I said, it minimizes inflammation, which inflammation in itself could cause scarring and it reduces swelling. So it's very valuable. Okay, here we go. So typically what we'll do is you start in one position and we would draw lines from one to the next just to see how it goes. But the first one is called MCP joint flexion. I always tell a patient to uh, make an alligator, but not a soft alligator, a mean alligator like that. You're going to follow that mean alligator with a full fist and your thumb in opposition. Here's the thing that people do with arthritis is they put their thumb at the side of their hand and they say, see, I'm making a fist. No, you're not. The thumb opposes. That's his glory. He's got the CMC joint here. So you're going to make a fist followed by thumb opposition. The next one is a strange one. It's kind of straight. It's like carrying a piece of drywall. It's on the left. You can see that I have no curl at the end of my fingers. This fires something called a specific muscle called the FDS. The next one right next door, you're going to claw. Move your fingers backwards at the back of your hand, but maintain that claw. And that's the FDP muscles. Those two are very important. They pull them from each other. So each one gets his own workout. And then the final one is just straight and wide. So you want them straight and wide. So going from one to the next, going through all phase, all five of those phases, I would say maybe do a set of five, relax, maybe another three to five, depending on your feel, how you're feeling, and you're good to go. Maybe do it a few hours later if you're still being, being stiff. I want to make one comment, though, which we're going to talk about in a minute, the use of modalities, which is heat makes everything so much easier. So we're going to talk about heat, but if you're feeling stiff and sore and want to try some of these exercises, using heat beforehand is really valuable. The other thing that I always talk about, everybody forgets about, are these muscles called um, intrinsic isometric, well, they're intrinsic muscles of the hand, which means they start and end in the hand as opposed to your long flexors start here, your extensors start here outside the hand. So these guys that start and end inside your hand, they abduct, which is move away, they adduct, which is move towards, and they do your mean alligator position. So those three muscles, abduct, adduct, and lumbrical positioning are very, very valuable. You can't pick up a dime off the countertop without addict, adducting your fingers and coming into lumbrical. You can't pick up a two liter without abducting the fingers and straightening them out. So we really work on those early on because when your hands hurt, you stop moving. And when you stop moving, those muscles get very weak, very quickly. So those are some of our top exercises are the differential tendon gliding exercises, the isolated isometric intrinsic exercises. And then there's another set we're gonna talk briefly about. Oh yeah, let's go back and show you this real quick. Here's the first one. What you're not seeing is, um, well, you can see it, but we, we tend to draw on these to kind of be more specific, but one hand, okay, you lie your forearm and your hand flat on the table. This business card. So somebody's squeezing the business card with their fingers and your other hand is pulling away at the same time. And then you relax and you do it again. So you're pulling that card away from yourself. You're arguing with yourself. And as you try to hold it, you're firing those muscles of adduction. You would then go from that one to the next one to the next one. So same position for the next set of exercises, forearms flat on the table, hands flat on the table. You take the other hand and you resist its effort to move away from the body. So you're using a stop and you try to move it away to the side. If that's too difficult for you to do, if you have um, issues on both hands, you can grasp a marker and just set a marker down like a highlighter and you're pushing against the highlighter. Just hold it for a couple seconds, relax. Hold it for a couple seconds, relax. You just need a stop gate. So your effort is to move without a big motion. You just fire the muscle and relax. And the last one, we sometimes just call bite the table or you can bite a book, but you get in your alligator position, you squeeze down, hold for a couple seconds, relax. Hold for a couple seconds, relax. You don't have to have giant motion. In fact, these muscles require very little motion to bring them back up to par. But this is one of the muscle groups that we find very early on that are weak with people. They get weak very quickly. 
this. Next one, the CM. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about the CMC joint. Remember, we said this one here, most worn out joint in the whole hand. It's because it's the coolest joint who does the most stuff, the saddle joint. So there's three exercises that are very valuable. What happens when you have a worn out CMC joint is you end up, your hand ends up being like this. He gets in this position of deformity and he doesn't want to get away. So you take your other hand and you actually give him a little squash as you pull him out. So you're going to squash him and pull him out. You're just stretching that adductor pollicis muscle. So you're releasing that tension and pulling him out. You don't have to pull it out so far that you're hurting this joint, but you squash the muscle and pull them out to the side. It's selectively targeted to open up the web space because a lot of people with arthritis, they end up closing that web space and that limits what you can do with your hand. The next one is just called a stable C position. Sometimes I call it a mean C. What you try to do is you keep these two joints bent and this guy moves your hand. So you're using the CMC joint. You're taking these two out of them by making them stay bent. And you come from here out, from here out. So it's the CMC joint that's doing all of the work. And then the third one is just to hold your arm and hand flat again on the table. Put a rubber band around your fingers. And it's this index finger here. He comes into abduction. Him alone. Other fingers don't move. Just he does. And that just works the first dorsal interossei. Again, that's one of the muscles that support the first CMC joint and helps to prevent deformity. Remember I talked earlier about pain management, well, the use of modalities. So one of the things it says in the literature that you can use cold or heat. If you're having a true RA flare up and you have a lot of edema and you wanna use cold, that's okay. Most of the people we see, we're using superficial heat modalities. So we use something called a, a paraffin bath. I love them. They've been around for years. When I see a patient, when we all see patients, one of the first thing we do is check and see if their insurance coverage will allow them to buy one, to have one at home because it heats deeply and it feels delicious. So what you do is you dunk your hand in a combination. It's not pure wax. It's paraffin wax and mineral oil. And then after you get so many dips of the wax, you cover it with a bag and then um, towels and you just cook and it feels wonderful. A lot of times I'll have people use one at, keep one at work and then one at home. So if you're having a hard day, you can use it at work too. So paraffin is a really important one. We do recommend the use of that. Some people don't want, don't have a place for one. They don't want one. So what works well is the use of warm water soaks. However, we're very particular when we tell people you don't stick your hand in water as hot as I can stand it. That's inappropriate. It's going to make you swell. It's 102 to 104 degrees, barely over body temperature. Think of the temperature of being in a jacuzzi and you can soak your hands in warm water. We always tell people to measure the heat of your water because even sometimes your water temperature at home is set higher than that. You can use um, rice socks, which again, we recommend, easy to make. You just take a white athletic sock, fill it about three quarters of the way up with dry rice, put a knot in it, stick it in the microwave for a minute, shake it up another minute, probably don't go over three, wrap it around your hand. And I'm gonna use this heat before I'm gonna go out and do my gardening. Or I just went out and did gardening and now my hands hurt. So I'm gonna wrap my hand in the rice sock. It feels wonderful and it's easy. You can use a heating pad too, but the heating pad people think, let's turn it up to high, more must be better. That might actually make you swell. So you're gonna to wanna to keep it down around low. That's kind of the important part. The other thing is there's something called a TENS unit. People commonly, um, have heard of these. Actually, I think you can buy them in Myers and places like that now. And their job is to basically block the gateway of pain, confuses your brain. Instead of having a pain impulse, it has, hmm, I'm not sure what that is, but I don't think it's pain. So that breaks up that cycle. The other thing in OT, you're going to see that um, we, well, you would see if you came here, is we make recommendations for the use of compression gloves. We like people to use compression gloves at night, full finger, because they snatch up your own body heat. You're just giving it away to the environment. So you might as well use that neutral warmth while you sleep to warm those joints and muscles and tendons and ligaments. In the morning, you just take them off. 
Um, there's nothing fancy about ours. They're, you can buy them on Amazon, but anything that keeps that neutral warmth in is, is, is comforting. Sometimes people like to wear them during the day. I would use different ones though. I'd use the ones with three quarter fingers. So you still have the tips of your fingers exposed. So your tactile sensation and feedback is intact. Um, you can still move in these things pretty, pretty easily. The other thing for pain management, are there medications and creams? What is the one called that's prescription people use a lot of now? Voltaren. 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 Yeah. yeah. Seems to have some good feedback in the use of Voltaren. Yeah. And then, of course, the use of orthotics. When you use the term, I think Bree mentioned it earlier, orthotics, it's the same thing as talking about splints. Um, splints, we can make them depending on it, how much deformity you have or what we're trying to achieve. We make them out of plastic and seal them with Velcro. They're custom made to you. The other thing is there's a lot of good prefabricated ones. We'll talk about a little bit, show you some pictures of those, those in a minute. And you can buy those online and they're comfortable too. A little compression, a little positioning, and just lets you rest your hand at night or protect your hand during the day. So we'll talk more, more about that in a minute. We're going to move on to adaptive equipment. This is one of OT's specialty to kind of find what works best for you. There's a multitude of things you can order on Amazon, from Myers, from Walmart. There's different things. But the goal of all of them is to make sure you are not using your hand as those tools. So when people say, oh, I can't open a jar. Well, when we were designed, our hands weren't meant and designed to open those tight, tight jars. So this is a few options that you can use. Dysum, it's this rubber kind of piece of material that helps you grip onto things. It provides a little bit more friction so your hands aren't slipping on the top of that jar. Another thing you can do is build up those handles. I know with teeth brushing specifically, you are in that lateral pinch where you are putting pressure on that CMC joint. So having a bigger handle on that prevents less of that uh, tight pressure where you are pushing and having pain at that CMC joint. You can also put that built up handle on eating utensils. You can put it on pens. You can put it on a lot of different things. We have a lot of different shapes and sizes depending on what your needs are. The rocker knife is another big one because you are putting that same force and pressure through that thumb. And the rocker knife, you hold it and you just rock back and forth, which we'll show you a picture of here. So your forearm is predominantly yes. doing the motion when you do that. Remember, we talked about using larger joints. Yeah. Uh, that's what she's talking about there. Nice picture. So that's the rocker knife. Another thing is a button hook. So instead of having those small pinches to be able to lace your buttons, it actually goes loops right through and helps pull your button through. And it looks like that. Good, go up. Yep, beautiful. So that's another option when that pinch and prehension is a little bit limited because of pain. Again, jar opener. So it, it's different than the Dysum. It actually is up in the right hand corner. Yep, beautiful. So different openers that just put less stress on those joints. Again, it's $7 from Amazon. So there's just different types of tools and adaptive equipment. So and go ahead. when she's talking about that jar opener, one thing you need to know is think about this. When you put your hand on the top of the jar, you are forcing your fingers into ulnar deviation. And if you remember that picture we showed for advanced RA, you're asking for deformity when you're doing that motion. So that's why what she's talking about is pretty important just to try and minimize. You can still open your own peanut butter and jelly jars. You just have to do it differently, that's all. And then same thing as the built up handles, it's that cylindrical foam that will help you build it up. So some of them come pre-built, like the ones with the button hook, how is a bigger uh, rubber type of handle. So some of them are already pre-built, but again, that cylindrical foam can be adapted to your toothbrush eating utensils you already have, pens and pencils you already have, and it slides right on and off where you can use it for different things. It's not a permanent fixture on something. The other thing too, if you wanna add um, pipe insulation to your rakes, your brooms, you can get it at Home Depot or Lowe's, wherever you shop, pipe insulation. It's a bigger grass, it's gonna be more comfortable and less painful. Slide it right on your rake, on your broom, whatever the case is, and it's gonna give you most more comfortable grass, especially when you're working against resistance. 
So let's talk a little bit about the word orthosis, which also means splint. I'm old school. I learned splint today. We talk about orthoses, though. There's two things you need to know about. One's prefabricated, meaning you can buy it online. You can buy it from a DME company. A therapist, however, has the skill and expertise to fabricate them. So they're custom made for you. We use a low temperature thermoplastic. It's molded right on you and then it's sealed with Velcro. We can make modifications along the way. The whole purpose of using splints with arthritis is to decrease inflammation and pain, to improve your function, or um, help to assist with diminishing the progression of deformity. And what you see on this slide is upper right-hand corner is a resting hand splint. That looks more like the one we would make out of plastic. Right below it is something called a pillow splint, P-I-L dash capital O dash splint. They're available on Amazon. They're very comfortable and they're not that expensive. Gives you a little neutral warmth, but it also keeps your hand in a functional resting position. It feels really nice. So we have them here. We issue them to patients or encourage you to buy them. It's hard to wear two splints at night. So you might want to alternate. Actually, this particular splint, you can wear it on right or left side, but you might want to alternate. If the right one hurts tonight, wear that. Wear the left one. I mean, some people can wear bilaterally. It's just a little cumbersome. In the middle, you're going to see something called a comfort cool, and that's a splint that doesn't have any rigid fixation. So there's no metal stays or plastic. It's all made out of a neoprene type material, but it has an extra strap that scoops around the CMC joint. You can, again, buy these on Amazon. It's called a comfort cool, but we do modify it a little bit to make sure we can clear the thumb before we issue it to the patient. But that's an, a, a nice example of a prefabricated splint that feels good, supports the joint, minimizes your pain with people who aren't extremely demanding of that joint. And on the left is something called a Rizzo Forte. It's spelled on the top, it's a little strangely named, but that's a beautiful splint for somebody who needs rigid fixation, meaning they're either subluxing at the CMC joint, meaning there's ligamentous instability. And so this splint puts you back in position and allows you to use your hand through the day. So it's a very good splint, easy to wear. Um, they are fairly expensive. I believe they're around $50, $55. So, you know, but they're worth it. Uh, I've had people who go back to gardening, rake, raking, shoveling, et cetera, with something like this. The next splint, just briefly, is called a silver ring splint. And what you see Picture on the left, the one on the bottom, this is a real hand, the ill effects of rheumatoid arthritis, and they can't even grip their cup. Once the silver ring splints are put on, you see how the fingers go into functional flexion. Silver ring splints, you need a therapist to evaluate the fit. We give you the form and you order it from the company. It doesn't go through us. It's an excellent company to work, company to work with. If for some reason it doesn't fit, they're really good about taking it back and exchanging it. But you do need a therapist to evaluate. There's all sorts of silver ring splints. Some of them, like I just fit one the other day, the lady's um, index finger was moving to the owner's side right at the end. It was her dominant right hand. It was driving her crazy. So I got her a splint that you could put on and actually gives them a little push over to keep them straight while allowing her to move. She loved it, reduced her pain right away. On the right is just another um that's another version of a, a silver ring splint. So you can see there's deformity on the bottom. It helps to reduce the form, deformity. And that one though, the finger can't still move. So you'd have to decide if it was worth reducing the deformity or not. The silver ring splints are beautiful. They're comfortable. They're expensive. They're over hundred dollars a piece, like $130, $140, depending on what you get, but they're beautiful and they fit well. And they're just very comfortable. So, so Renew Physical Therapy is now offering occupational therapy and on our sheet that is provided to you, we have OT at our Bridgeport Clinic, Carroll Clinic, Frankenmuth Clinic, and Saginaw Bay Road. Um, Kate, is there any questions for us? Yes, we had a number of questions that came in from people who registered, so I'm going to jump around a little bit. I hope you guys don't mind. Um, one question we had was if there's a cream that you recommend that this person can use at work that isn't greasy and doesn't smell. So most of the creams don't have research studies to accompany them. So we're not going to advise you on a cream. Your physician might be able to. 
I know that there's a prescription drug called Voltaren. I don't know how greasy it is. I know people like it and they seem to get good pain relief from it. But there's probably, I don't even know how many medications out there on the shelves at Myers or Rite Aid. And honestly, trial and error is going to be for you. But that's not something we would necessarily recommend. And Voltaren has now changed to um, non-prescription mm -hmm. over the counter now. Yeah. So that's the only one I really have gotten feedback on you guys, but that's yeah. the one that stands out that people seem to like. So you could try that. Sounds good. Um, and I know we talked a little bit about splints, but somebody asked if there's like a best position for the hands during sleep or positions you want to avoid during sleep. Well, if you don't have pain while you sleep, you, you don't need a splint. But if you remember that picture, upper right hand, yes, the answer is the resting hand splint, which is wrist is neutral to gently extended, a little bit of flexion at these joints called the MCP joints. You can have resting flexion at these joints. The thumb is out to the side. You don't want to sleep like this, curled up because you're cold. And I know I do, and a lot of people do. You can end up with other things like nerve entrapment, carpal tunnel. So when you can extend the wrist and just, if you just relax your hand, it's going to kind of go normally go in that position. So the resting hand splint, resting hand position is probably the best one to sleep in. Very interesting. Um, this I've got two kind of questions that are a little bit diet related, and I'm sure you'd want people to run this by their doctors, but just wondering if you have any opinions on it. One is that can I alleviate arthritis by cutting wheat flour out of my diet? So that would be something that you'd have to consult your physician or family doctor for. We cannot make recommendations, yeah, make recommendations specifically. specifically for diet because that's out of our scope of practice. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Um, this one is, is very specific, but kind of interesting. Um, will CMC bone removal affect guitar playing to the best of your knowledge? We were actually talking about this earlier because um, we heard that question was coming. And um, you have to remember what surgery on the CMC joint is for. It's called an interpositional arthroplasty or IPA. Its goal is to eliminate pain at the CMC joint. It's an excellent procedure. It's been around for years and years and years. They actually remove a, a worn out bone. They throw that in the trash and then they make a pad out of um, a, a tendon that you can spare. You have some redundancies in the hand and they put it in that vacated space then make a sling. So it's an excellent procedure. We see them a lot. People do return to guitar playing. But I'm not a guitar player, so I don't know. But I know there's a, a, an element of resistance when you hold those strings down. So you can't, um, you may have just a tiny bit of weakness after you have this procedure than from before. But if playing the guitar isn't terribly resistive, you're going to be, and you're doing it now, you're going to be able to do it now without pain. So I'm an advocate of the IPA. I think it's a wonderful position for people who want to remain active. Okay, I have three more questions. You guys up for it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not familiar with this term, but it um, says what can be done about zigzag thumbs? Is that familiar to you? Mm -hmm. So when you talk about zigzag thumb, what you're talking about is the ligaments that support the bones in the thumb have become um, stretched out or broken and they're no longer doing their job. Ligaments hold bone to bone, that's their job. So when they become lax and worn out, you become sloppy and you often see strange positions. So you're no longer in the typical position, you're in odd positions. It may be flexion, it might be extension. That's, um, if you're at that point, um, what I would recommend is you consult a specialist. Now, of course your rheumatologist is an excellent resource. We work with surgeons from the University of Michigan, and there are surgeons down there who do joint replacements. They can fuse joints. Um, there's all sorts of reconstructive options um, for addressing the thumb, but it would all depend on how severe your deformity was. Or if you said, there's no way I'm ever having surgery, come on in, we'll take a look at a silver ring splint. Because sometimes if you're easily easy to reduce and put back in your normal position, that silver ring splint can maintain that for you. So lots of different options, but it depends really what's wrong. Okay, good to know. Um, another question was, 
what would be the first thing to try for hands that tingle and go to sleep? I'll just keep talking to you. Um, <laughs> so the first thing that we would recommend is definitely seek out a hand specialist. They can kind of tell you what's going on. There's diagnostic testing that can tell you if there's any sort of nerve entrapment and see kind of what the next steps are. Yeah, that is. So inflammation from arthritis can actually shut down nerve function, depending on where it is. You know, you only have so much room in your fingers or in your hand and lots of things go through your hand, like, like bone and muscle and ligaments and tendons and vascular supply and lymphatic drainage. And if something is swollen, everybody else is going to be compromised. They can't do their job. So it's not unusual to have numbness or tingling. The question is, where is it coming from? So everybody's heard of carpal tunnel syndrome. That's entrapment at the wrist. You can have cubital tunnel syndrome at the elbow. There's all sorts of things that can occur. But your physician is the one who really should make the judgment call to say, you know what? She's been complaining of this for six months. Let's get an EMG, which is an electrical study that um, tests how well the nerve is functioning. So I'd start with the family doctor, see if imaging is appropriate. If not, get an OT referral, come on in. We'll do some testing and see what we can come up with. Wonderful. Um, I had a couple that just came in live. So now I have a few more questions. Um, I think this was when we were talking about the guitar playing. Somebody asked if that would be similar for playing piano, similar concerns. Yeah, I don't think there's be, I, again, I'm not a pian pianist, <laughs> but... If, if if I know this from what I've seen, people who play the piano are using digital extension and abduction and adduction, not so much the CMC joint. So I don't see that being as big of an undertaking. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, remember when we're talking about yeah. that interposition arthroplasty is the first CMC to the thumb. So maybe you do use your thumb, but piano keys, in my opinion, are easier to press than hold chords on the neck of a guitar. So I think your guitar player is gonna struggle a little bit more than the piano player. That would be my opinion, uneducated opinion. Great, and then somebody else has a question that I can answer. Um, she asked if we can provide um, the hand exercises and the list of tools. And everybody who registered for this webinar is gonna receive a follow-up email. So I can definitely make sure to include some helpful links um, and resources there. So look for that soon. It will also include a link to view the recording of this webinar. So if there's anything that you wanted to rewatch or kind of go over again with the experts, that'll be available. Um, so my last question for you guys, um, somebody asked, what are the earliest signs of arthritis of the hand? And is there anything people can do when they first see those signs to minimize the damage and the pain later? Probably early on, you're going to notice that the activities you used to do take you longer. You may have pain afterwards. Um, you may be a little weaker. It's not as easy. I mean, those, in my opinion, would be the more early signs of arthritis. Um, what you're going to want to do is we talked about maintaining your weight, keeping active, trying to get into, use your aerobic exercise, get into a daily activity where you're still firing those muscles and moving those joints. Um, so, practice joint preservation strategies yes. and integrate those into your routines. Yeah. So if you're doing a manual labor position and you're constantly hammering against rock or bending metal with pliers or whatever the case is, you're gonna have to modify your behaviors or you're just gonna continue to wear out those joints. Wonderful. That's all I have for questions. So thank you, ladies, for sharing everything. Um, and I would just encourage anybody who has, you know, a very specific question to come and get an appointment with these ladies. Everybody has different needs and they can really help identify what's going on with you, what you need for your lifestyle, and give you a plan that works for you. Okay, can I make one more comment? Just if somebody yep. is interested in coming to outpatient occupational therapy. Um, that's what you'd want the doctor to write on the prescription and just evaluation, evaluate and treat, evaluation and treatment. And if you have a diagnosis, obviously of OA or RA, that would be helpful. But just have your doctor write evaluation and treat, occupational therapy, and we can take it from there. 
Excellent. Thank you again, ladies. So again, everybody look for that follow up email that will have lots of good information and how to contact us if you need to. Well, thanks all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.